Good morning and good afternoon, Water Talks, and welcome to what happens to actually be uh, a record-setting event here. <laughs> this is our largest registration for Water Talks, so thank you all for joining. Uh, excited to kind of see all of your questions, and thank you, Matt and Pat Moore, for uh, joining us here. All right, so to introduce our speakers here today, um, again, we're, we're very excited to have a um, customer client uh, guest presenter join us, Matt Hong, who has actually taught uh, some staff here at Invise how to do hydraulic modeling. Um, he's going to be presenting um, on a topic that has been in demand for the last year. So again, very excited to be uh, to have you here today, Matt. If you wanted to briefly introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Matt Huang. I'm with Corolla Engineers. Um, I'm a Corolla's uh, pressurized distribution system modeling and master planning lead. And uh, I'm glad to be with you here. I've used the Intervise software for over 20 years. And so uh, glad to be able to share this today. Perfect. Thanks, Matt. And just at the last minute here, thank you, Pat, uh, for joining <laughs> us here as well today. I know I messaged you this morning. Pat, uh, we've got so many people on today. Would you be willing to join here? And, and thank you for being flexible and, and coming on here this morning. Pat, do you want to introduce yourself to everybody? Uh, Patrick Moore, uh, many long time year user of the software, uh, been here in uh, technical support for six years, uh, was a uh, engineering consultant for 15 and a half years before that, uh, and predominantly support the Infwater, Infwater Pro and other water product software. So I uh, also did many calibrations over the years, so um, it's exciting to hear a lot of stuff that Matt's going to be talking about today. It's good stuff. Perfect. Thanks, Pat. As for myself, I'm I'm a solutions engineer here at Innovize. Uh, I've been hosting these water talks off and on for the last year or so, focused mainly on asset management. So very happy to have um, you know both of you on and your many, many years of water distribution expertise to be able to uh, share with everybody today. Uh, for those of you who might not know or might not have attended water talks before, uh, again, the idea is we really want to hear uh, your questions here. Uh, Matt's presentation does not take up the full hour. Uh, in fact, we're, we're really looking to hear your questions, be able to answer those. There should be quite a few uh, since this topic is on water modeling calibration, which can be kind of a tricky, tedious thing uh, sometimes for utilities and consultants working on different projects. So, uh, again, super excited to have a client presenter as well. If you would like to present on Water Talks, please do reach out and let us know. Uh, as far as upcoming events, things to watch out for, uh, we'll be taking next week off, the 4th of July holiday here. Everyone just getting back to work on Tuesday, so no water talks next week. Uh, the following week, July 13th, uh, Nathan Gertz and Mel Meng from Innovise will be presenting on kind of a um, collection system uh, live modeling implementation uh, that they'll be presenting later at the Ohio One uh, Water Conference, a little preview of that. And then as far as the rest of the month of July is concerned, we have a lot of things going on in terms of our new cloud platform. Some of you may have heard of Info360. So on July 14th, Smart Water Magazine will be hosting us as we talk about Info360 and kind of the cloud implementation uh, at Scottsdale. Um, then on July 20th, uh, AWWA will be hosting us in lieu of kind of our normal water talks that we would have on that Tuesday. Uh, and again, we'll be talking about Info360 and just kind of digital transformation in the water sector uh, with Amazon Web Services. And then on July 27th, uh, we'll be introducing kind of a new module to Info360 that we're very excited about, brand new module uh, to really focus in on asset management, specifically on the sewer side there. So a lot of Info360 things, uh, but for today, uh, again, very focused on water distribution, specifically uh, calibration. So before I turn it over to Matt, he had a couple of poll questions uh, he wanted to throw out there for everybody. So I am going to to launch this poll here. All right, so the first poll, uh, what type of organization are you from? Looking through, again, a record number of folks that registered for this. We saw lots of different uh, organizations, uh, utility organizations, consulting, software, maybe like ourselves, uh, you know, just to get an idea uh, where folks are from was the first question. So, 
Okay, so it looks like we're about 50-50 split here. Let's see if I close that poll, what everybody will see. Uh, yeah, share that. Yeah, so it looks like we're about a 50-50 split, mostly uh, a little bit more on the consultant side, but a good split really between utilities yeah. and consultants there. Uh, so that's great to see. And then the next poll here, Next poll. It's the anticipation. Ah, yes. <laughs> All right, here we go. Uh, and then the, what level, there it is. Okay, what level uh, of uh, hydraulic modeling kind of calibration expertise uh, are, do you currently you know, maybe have? What level are you coming in with? Um, so kind of base level, absolutely zero, all the way to expert, uh, you know, I should be teaching Matt and Pat somehow on how to do this. So a um, couple of options there. And it looks like folks are mainly uh, falling in the middle there. Just yeah, that's what I would expect. So I'll go ahead and close that and share that. Hmm. And so just to give everyone an idea, that's where uh, things lie there. All right, so perfect. Uh, hopefully that gives you a good idea, Matt. Uh, right in the middle, good good split uh, for everybody here. I am going to turn over sharing to you. And the floor is yours. Thanks again for joining, Matt. Great. Um, I'm trying to share Tim, but I'm not, it's not seeming to go. Oh, let me see if I need to hide the. You have to make in the presenter. Uh, yep. You should be the presenter. I think I'm, I think I'm sharing now. Thank you, everyone. Oh, I think you've got, do you have the right screen there? Yep, I don't. There we go. Perfect. There you go. Okay, Rock great. Thank you, Pat. Thanks, Matt. Thank you, everyone. Um, so today, uh, our topic is calibration of water systems models. And, you know, while we normally, you know, when we talk about calibration of water system models, you know, we're normally talking about potable water, water systems, but this is really relevant to any kind of pressurized water system, you know, whether we're talking about potable water, reclaimed or recycled water, you know, it might be utility water at a, a treatment plant, um, you know, and so, you know, there's a wide variety of, of um, potential uh, uses for this. And uh, Innovise does offer a whole suite of software packages that do for this kind of work. Um, you know, historically, H2O Net uh, was the, you know, first uh, Innovise package that was out. Um, today, most folks are using either InfoWater or InfoWater Pro. Um, you know, there's a smaller group of folks that are using InfoWorks WS, uh, but from, you know, this basic uh, stuff that I'm talking about calibration today would cover any of these software packages. Um, so, you know, if we're talking about water system modeling, you know, there's really three big steps. So the first is model development, you know, how do we build our model? The second is, you know, once you've built your model, then you can then you calibrate it. And then once you calibrate it, then we can use the model for evaluation purposes. And skipping these steps or going in a different order will generally not give you the results you want. You know, so the question is, why do you trust model results? You know, this is a example graph where well, I have field data from different days and a model data. And, and one can see for this tank level, this data doesn't calibrate. You know, another graph, is this one better? This, do you trust this one? Well, maybe, maybe not. You know, this tank looks looks better, much better. You know, but, but how do you know if your model's calibrated or not? And why do you calibrate? 
And I think the question really is, what are you going to use the model for? And are you going to trust the results coming out of the model? A lot of times engineers or people just say, well, the model says this, so it has to be this. Well, really that depends on if your model is calibrated or not and what kind of results it gives. Um, you know, let's look at some standards um, in the U.S. and Canada. You know, kind of the basic standard is AWWA M32. You know, and the guidelines given in there is, you know, we want to model, um, we want to calibrate HDL to within five to ten feet, or which is 2.2 .2 to 4.3 psi, and uh, levels within three to six feet. Um, but with the with the higher end of the range for planning and the lower end of the range, if you're going to use it for design and, and I'd argue if you're going to want to use the off the model for operational purposes, you want to, you need to have even better calibration. Um, you know, another comparison is um, some UK guidelines. Um, they talk about flows within 5% for 16 inch and greater pipelines and within 10% for smaller pipelines. Um, and then they, then uh, M32 refers to pressures within um, 1.6 feet or 5% for 85% of the test with a larger band allowed for um, the remaining 15%. And so these are standards that are out there that um, you know, could be referred to. Now, now when we calibrate, you know, we usually look at kind of three different conditions and and so the kind of the most basic uh, model calibration condition would be kind of a steady state model under typical demands you know once once you've calibrated for that uh, then you know we'd look at steady state under some kind of higher demands like fire flow and then we we would calibrate for um, extended period simulation, you know, which is a 24 hour or a week long um, simulation. Now, kind of stepping back, well, so once you've built your model, you know, how do you calibrate it? And so normally we have four steps. Uh, one is uh, we'd have field data collection. Uh, so for field data collection, we would, um, you know, collect data from the field, whether that would be SCADA systems, pressure loggers, um, fire flow tests in the field. You know, then we would set up our model in order to replicate field conditions. So we want to match boundary conditions. You know, are the pumps feeding the area on or are they off? You know, what are the tank levels? You know, are our base demands between the time of the field condition and and the time you're running the model, you want those to be the same. And so we can once we replicate the field condition and the boundary conditions, then we can compare the model results with the field results and say, well, are these any good? And and from there, uh, we're able to adjust the model as necessary. So when you're out collecting data in the field, um, there'd be fire hydrant tests. Um, that's often done, at least in cooler climates where there are less concerns of water scarcity. Pressure loggers uh, can be installed out in the field on hydrants or in other places in the system. Often SCADA data um, is collected from people's SCADA system. Um, you know, in the old days, um, at least when I started, you know, there were still manual charts. And, and I do know some agencies that still have these manual charts where they have to be read by hand that um, can give data of what's going on in the system. And so generally, we're looking at pressures, flows, tank levels are kind of the three uh, major points that we're using for field data collection, uh, but, but also the boundary conditions of what pumps are on or or if there's information about control valve setting. Um, so, you know, this next set of slides in my presentation, I'm going to say, ask, 
well, what do you need to adjust to calibrate, right? So we talked about starting under um, a steady state normal low flow condition, you know, and so this is kind of boundary conditions, you know, how about your tank water levels? Are your tank water levels correct? Have we set the correct initial levels? Um, you know, another, another place we might be adjusting, especially early on, would be elevation. Um, you know, at our, at our junctions and in our facilities, um, you know, there's, there's somewhat of a debate sometimes on, you know, do we model our elevations at ground level or at center line of pipe? But, you know, I think most folks will model at, at ground level. Um, but, you know, often our data that we have is not that good. I mean, we have all sorts of topo data that's available now to set model elevations, but, you know, there's some, so the question is, well, are those elevations good? You know, especially when you have a pump station, say that's uh, way down deep in the ground and, you know, there's a pressure logger down at that height of that pump that could adjust your calibration of the pressure of that location. So sometimes, you know, we do need to adjust elevations so they match um, what's going on, especially in uh, areas with high topography. Um, pump curves can be adjusted. This is a, you know, normally we're putting in a multi-point curves, though there's also three-point curves and extended curves and single design point curves that can be put in the model. Um, over time, pumps, um, the impellers wear. And so because of that, the pump curves do change. And so it's important that we adjust pump curves accordingly. Um, and so these are things that, that need to be adjusted during calibration when your flows don't match. Um, another thing that we miss a lot are pressure zone boundaries. You know, this would be an example of a location where um, the system with two colors has has a pressure zone boundary and do we have a pressure zone boundary in the right place which means you need a closed pipe or a closed valve uh, to represent that that zone boundary um you know a lot of times you know i've seen in models where the model got built but uh, the pressure zone boundary didn't get closed um so we're getting a lot of flow from one zone to the other which is which was not reflective in the field and so therefore you know these are things that need to be adjusted during calibration and then valve set points um, the pressure reducing valves prvs are very common in the water systems and that's what the question is you know are those valves set those set points set correctly and um you know but it's not just pressure reducing valves if they're sustaining valves um the water has i don't know six seven eight different types of valves that could be modeled you know are those valves modeled correctly and those um, and the set points set right and, and that does become a question um, that can be adjusted during calibration especially because you know often these um these valves when they're set they're they're actually quite hard to set at a particular set point unless there's some kind of electronic connection to SCADA, which is not that common for a lot of agencies. So folks are adjusting these things by hand and certain, getting a certain number of cranks in on the valve. Um, under, you know, steady state periods of high head loss, so now this is an example of a, you know, a high demand condition, you know, maybe a, a max day or a peak hour or a, a fire flow case. You know, pipe roughness coefficients can be adjusted. Um, you know, folks are using usually Hayes and Williams, sometimes um, Man uh, Manning's equation or, or other um, equations. And, you know, do we have the right pipe, pipe roughness? 
um, that's going that reflects what's actually going on in the field. And so roughness is this is the opportunity to, to adjust those pipe roughnesses. Um, demand allocation. Um, again, InfoWater has a, a pretty extensive demand allocation tool that would help um, distribute demands, but especially uh, when you have a large customer, um, you know, is that customer at the right location? You know, if you had a very large customer on a six inch pipe, you know, in a larger city, maybe that's not the correct location and that would create unnecessary head loss. And so when you calibrate, you know, it's an opportunity to look at, at uh, the demand allocation, and how the demands are distributed. Again, we talked about earlier about setting the demand so the demands are at the right uh, level or as a total, but sometimes you find that that is not correct and that needs to be adjusted during calibration. Um, connectivity. Are the, are the pipes connected? Um, InfoWater has some connectivity tools, but I've seen this a lot of times where, you know, they may look like they're connected or, a, or they're say a T-junction, but in, in the model, actually the, the pipe that goes through just goes straight through the intersection and doesn't, uh, doesn't connect. And therefore there's no connection in the model itself. Um, so, you know, that's a connectivity issue. Uh, sometimes you have two nodes that are very close together, but they don't actually connect. Um, so during uh, periods of high head loss are better opportunities to find some remaining connectivity issues in the model where, you know, they're connecting in the field, but the model does not have them connected. And sometimes it, it goes the other way where the model has something connected, but it's not connected in the field. Um, pipe size, you know, is the, are the pipes the right size? Um, excessive skeletonization is another area of concern sometimes. Um, you know, nowadays, I think as people are moving to one-to-one -one, uh, GIS correlation, folks are not skeletonizing the model too much, but um, in the past, um, models were skeletonized quite a bit uh, just to to speed up run times and not have so much data to process. And if you're over skeletonizing, uh, that could create extra head loss. You know, I guess back to connectivity, you know, the, the, the skeletonization in the sense is like having missing pipes in the model. Um, yep, hey Tim. Hey, a couple of questions I think that related particularly to that last slide uh, when you're looking at different parameters there. Uh, we had a question and we had quite a few come in uh, from Casey. What about um, minor losses? How are minor losses used within calibration? Would that be one of those things you might tweak there or, or, or in what of those five categories might those kind of come in? Uh, is there kind of a parameter that helps with guess and check to get the model results to match the real world there when it again comes to minor losses? Yeah, um, you know, there's kind of differing opinions across the hydraulic modeling industry. I see, I feel like toward minor yeah. losses. I yeah. would, I would say that minor losses are more important when you have when you're doing a design level calibration or you're going to use the model for design compared to using it for planning. And it, it, it plays a more major impact at your facilities. So when you have yeah. control valves and, and pump stations or, or situations where you have a single pipeline, uh, minor losses of a greater concern. And, and yes, I mean, again, this is, you know, along with the pipe roughness, uh, this would be a good place to adjust minor losses, especially yeah. at facilities. Pat, were you gonna add something? I was gonna say, yeah. A lot of times with a even just a slightly conservative C factor, I think you pretty much can account for the head loss in a, a, that's associated with a minor loss pretty effectively. I mean, you can calculate out, you know, what V squared over 2G times K, that's the minor loss head loss. V is the velocity squared 2G gravity. So that V squared over 2G, you know, G is 32.2. So, you know, V squared 
has to be, you know, eight before that has to be, you know, it's one <laughs> times k before that's even, you know, you know, in a in a fraction that gets to be greater than one. So it's it it has to be a lot of velocity, and most of the times you're less than five, you know, in your normal operation until you get to fire before it's going to be too impactful. So it's I, I think a lot of times when you're calibrating with a reasonable seat factor, you're seeing numbers that are that are reasonable enough that a lot of times you're not, unless it's a like in a PRV mat, you know, to keep it from getting too excessive of a high flow. You know, if you don't put a minor loss on a PRV valve, you can get a two inch PRV that'll give you 20,000 gallons a minute, which is like no way, you know, but it mathematically it'll do that because there's nothing to cap that high end flow. And I think you kind of hit on again, the minor losses kind of go into that roughness a little bit here. You kind of answered Timothy's question here. Where is a good place to obtain those roughness coefficients and how could they be uh, adjusted there it is another question I think just related to the um, slide in particular. You know, I, I referred to AWWA M32 early in my presentation and uh, there is a page in there for roughness coefficients for different types of pipes. Um, now, one thing I would comment on is that kind of reference in there is normally with new pipes. And so when you're looking at older pipe over time, um, you know, they will need to be degraded and, and something lower needed, especially um, when you have older tech cast iron pipe, which can be significantly lower. And then that's what I would say, it, but most pipes that are like cement mortar lined or plastic tend to not corrode internally so they they're not really changing too much i mean you you see 40 50 year old coupons of you know anything cement mortar line or plastic and it's hard to tell they're much older than five years old you know but yeah anything like online cast iron <laughs> man that that's reducing that diameter a lot that's definitely that's the poster child for c factors that change over time but if you don't have that a lot of times those book values for those are pretty good numbers. I mean, and a lot of people don't see those heat factors change in fit calibration a lot. I mean, Matt, did you, you know, find the same? I We used to found that a lot that unless they were online cast iron, we weren't changing those much and we're seeing that match a lot. Uh, but if it's online cast iron, definitely you had to change those for sure. Well, you know, I, I, I would agree with you, Pat. I, I think the question is, you know, sometimes these book values are or on the order of 140, 150, even toward 160 sometimes. And, you know, by the, if you want to account for, you know, kind of fittings and things like that in a distribution system, you know, you may be using something on the 120, 130 range rather yeah. than the 140, 150 range uh, to account for those types yeah. of fittings if you're not putting minor losses at every, you know, every right. isolation valve and so on, which is, which is common for, for most models. Yeah, and I think that's kind of numbers we generally use that were more in the, you know, 120, 130-ish, you know, uh, you know, I think on the high end, you might see something 140 percent on bigger pipe, but yeah, most of the time it's uh, there. It's certainly nothing less than 50-odd, something that C-factor, you know, generally, if it's much lower than that, it's usually something else going on. But uh, we've got Perfect. at least something that gives people an idea if they they can contact us at support uh, that at least can give them an idea of, of things that uh, uh, yeah, I know I used for many years, at least was a starting point if that's helpful to say, hey, uh, this may may give you at least some ideas of where to start. Uh, you know, if they, they'd like that, I've, I've definitely shared with that with people that we can send it to. Perfect. Lots more questions, Matt, but uh, I think that's it for that slide. Hold off. Let you keep going here. OK, great. Um, so you know, the next stage would be extended period simulation. And um, you know, often the place would be uh, pumper valve controls. You know, are, the, are the controls set correctly on when uh, the pumper valve is kicked off on or off. Um, demand patterns are another um, thing that can be adjusted. You know, do 
when we're in extended period simulation, we're typically modeling, you know, over the whole day. So the question is, you know, do the demand patterns reflect? Um, are they realistic? And uh, sync dimensions are another thing that often get adjusted during uh, ETS calibration that you wouldn't catch during. Well, anyway, this is not steady state. Okay, my 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 header is not is is incorrect on these slides. Um, and so, uh, you know, the tank dimensions are another important thing. And so, once you get your model calibrated, you know. Folks are often, okay, let's get ready, let's run our model. Well, there's a few things to check. Uh, some folks actually do a, another round of model verification under a different set of, of data to say, well, now that I've calibrated my model, is it act, how does it work under a different condition? You know, that could, but doesn't have to be done. Um, we, wanna, we wanna make sure we set demands of reflective of the condition that that we might see or project to see. Um, sometimes we don't necessarily, you know, ideally we want to calibrate our model under, um, you know, some high demand period and often also a low demand condition. But that may, that condition that you calibrate your model to may not be the calibration that you want to do your analysis. With. And then, so the question is, do we set boundary conditions appropriately? You know, often you, you want to, Make sure you've got the supplies that you want. Um, your initial tank levels are appropriate. You know the pumps that you want running are correct. And and often when we calibrate, you know sometimes the the controls that are set in the model are end up being very specific for the day of calibration. Um, but operators don't always operate those models, operate the systems in that way under all times. And so. Uh, something that's a little more uh, appropriate and flexible is often helpful when you're running your model. Um, you know, one one trend that we're seeing um, is Info 360 uh, coming into play, and and as you saw on um, Tim's uh, initial slide about upcoming events, there's a lot of discussion about Info 360 becoming cloud-based. Um, and Info 360 can assist with uh, continuous calibration uh, because if it's con if it's connected to your uh, SCADA system that's outputting data on a consistent basis, you have an opportunity to compare your model a lot more often. And so with that, um, I'll turn it back to Tim for uh, some additional questions. Perfect. Thanks, Matt. Uh, lots of time for these questions that are coming in. Uh, fast and furious here, so appreciate all that, and um, yeah, thanks for the 360 shout out at the end there too. Uh, it is a tool that, that certainly uh, is built to help with calibration in, in many ways, make this process a little, a little bit more seamless because we know it, it can be uh, kind of time consuming, and it's important to get right for sure. Um, so let's see. Hey, Tim, uh, one thing that I wanted to, to say, uh, it, it just if, if there's one thing I think is always helpful in any calibration, it's if you change something, make sure that it's reasonable to change it and that it's defendable. And it, it's it's just like what Matt was saying, you know, like, hey, what's the best test that, hey, was this the right thing to change? Is that if you look at it in other conditions, is it also match up? Uh, a great example of that was a calibration when I very first started, I mean, this was <laughs> golly, like 20 years ago. Um, before I even got there, they had just completed it and they had, it was a massive system, but the only thing that they had changed was C factors and they had three different demand conditions and they used three different C factors to justify, you know, the changes that they made and to make things fit. And it was like, well, it's not like you're changing the pipes, like, okay, it's summertime, let's turn on the summer pipes, you know, okay, now turn those off, it's now the winter pipes. You know, because if it really was the C factors, all those would match, and and it would be those that were there. And that's and that's those kind of things of saying, hey, when we make something, if it's really what was wrong, it should make sense and it should be consistent. If it's not what was wrong, then you know, hey, when we change something, 
if it's not fitting, that's that's probably a clue that, hey, that wasn't really what was wrong. It might have made it better for that one condition, but it wasn't there. It turned out in that model, it was actually their demand curves because they had some meters that were like high and low on paper charts. And you actually had one of the pins that was delayed three hours. So it, in order to read them, you had to realize that one pin was three hours delayed, but their demands would go way up and then it'd go to zero and then way up and then go to zero. But they, you know, they didn't go, gee, that looks weird. You know, the people really in the water like that, you know, they just assume, well, yeah, boy, these guys have really, really weird water use. But again, you know, it's that, does it make sense? Does this look right? And if not, when you're changing something, you know, thinking that through, because I, I always found that's that's so helpful. I mean, and just to keep in mind, because, you know, and it, it really helps keep you from just, I, you, you always get that, I want to start randomly changing things, hoping it'll fix it or make it better. But you might inadvertently be making something wrong or or kind of forcing a fix that really isn't what's wrong. And so you're kind of artificially making a problem down the road by fixing something that wasn't really wrong. So just watch out for that. Yeah, I, I, I think that's a good point that Pat made because, you know, I've done enough modeling to know that I can probably make any point in any model match. Yeah. But that doesn't mean it's calibrated um, because I can do things that are unreasonable to right. make a model match. Right. And, 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 and it's, I think it's important for us to remember that, um, you know, common sense is really important when we're calibrating. And yeah, and good engineering judgment to just think through like, man, is it what, and you know, like, uh, and Matt, you had a lot of great points, you know, like I always tell people like, fix what you know, you know, their boundary conditions are all my boundary conditions good you know uh if you adjust those good before you start adjusting things because a lot of times it's your boundary conditions also the you you brought up the the connectivity issues uh i remember when we were doing so much uh calibration work uh, i think at the time you and i met in 2007 2008 um we were finding the vast majority of our calibration issues were connectivity issues and so we we ended up saying when we started seeing this over and over again, like, oh my goodness, you know, all these these issues were just connectivity issues, uh, you know, that we're like, okay, let's, and we were doing lots of model builds and calibrations. We found let's let's shift a lot of our budget to when we did the build to to look for connectivity issues because we expect that they're there. We found that our calibrations were a lot easier, you know, when we weren't anticipating those and we were finding man we're spending so much time on calibrations and it was so much harder versus when we addressed those on the front end it was like man calibration got a lot easier because we took care of all the stuff that was causing most of them that that was so helpful you know and it, it's just amazing how you know it's like okay you know just some of these little simple tricks was just amazing that you know that that really helped Perfect. I want to make sure we get to some of these questions here. Uh, okay. There are quite a few. Um, let's see. Were there, were there any that stuck out to you, Pat, that you really wanted to answer, um, I guess, first? Or um, Hey, I did send you as an attachment, if you want to include it here, at that C-factor table. So that if, I don't know. I didn't know how to add it as a handout. Um, okay. But if you wanted to add that. Um, and that's uh, a good point for everyone on the on presentation. The, the um, slides are available in PDF format as a handout in the GoToWebinar. You haven't seen that. Um, there are a couple, hopefully, real quick questions we can get through. Um, real quickly, question from Julian, recommendation, he kind of mentioned this, Darcy versus Hazen, uh, which do you normally go, this sounded like Hazen, is that right? Um, you know, again, I think this is debatable in the industry. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, I've generally gone Hazen, on a personal basis, but you know, I know of lots of engineers that would argue the other way. <laughs> I would go Hazen just because I think it's reasonable enough. Uh, that's how I'd okay. answer that. Perfect. I, mean, um, I, I, I think the one comment I would make there is that um, just recognize that Hazen does have some limitations 
And so if you're in some extremely high velocities, Hazen doesn't always apply. And and dark speed is actually more um, accurate. And I definitely agree with that. Uh, but I think in most things it's good enough, and that's that's uh, uh, why most people end up using it. It's certainly easier, uh, I think, in the model to use. Uh, it's a little more complex with the. Uh, uh, Darcy Weisbach and the three different flow ranges um, right. that it has. Okay. Um, I'm seeing quite a few questions in here regarding kind of demand allocation. What do you do if you don't have, you know, the right demand data? You know, what's what's your first way that you like to allocate demand? Do you have any just kind of general tips on demand allocation uh, as part of the calibration process? What's kind of the standard um, procedure for you and, and what do you do if you're missing some data at, at one of those steps? Um, my preference is to use billing data for a distribution if you can. Um, you know, a lot of agencies are beginning to go to AMI and if you have AMI data, um, you know, Even better. those are really helpful, but um, you know, the, I, I would say the more, the smaller you can make um, your data in ge geographically, the better you're going to be. But even a, a month billing data is fantastic in most cases. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Um, seeing a couple of questions here regarding. Um, Gosh, a couple here regarding sizing and diameter here. So I'm just going to pick this one I see right here. In regards to pipe sizes, uh, would I be correct in saying that the sizes would uh, have to be the internal diameters of the pipe? And, and how do you best verify this if you're extracting info from GIS where you might just be getting the, I'm guessing, the external diameter of that pipe? Uh, again, I, I think this is one under debate in the mm -hmm. modeling community. Um, you know, a lot of a lot of the, the pipe that you get is not necessarily external, it's nominal. And, and so if you were to be actually looking at, you know, pipe catalogs, you'll notice that there are a bunch of different um, um, ranges of how that works. Um, you know, most people that I know are actually, actually just end up modeling with uh, nominal diameter and adjusting, you know, their C factors accordingly. Um, but, you know, there are a few that do, you know, go back and look at, you know, what pipe type there are and, and adjust the diameters based on that. But I think that's relatively rare. Pat, you have a comment here? On, uh, I'm sorry, I was reading the questions. Uh, <laughs> so uh, on, on, we were reading all the... on, on diameters, what diameter should you use? Most of the time, I... Uh, on every one we ever did, we always stuck with nominal, uh, just because it really gets crazy trying to keep track of the actuals. Not that you couldn't, um, but I always felt like it was it was very reasonable. And I think again, it kind of comes back to those reasonable C factors with nominals work pretty reasonably. Um, that I never really had any issues on it, especially when you were, they were calibrating well, you know, with both uh, hydrant flow tests, which is probably where they're gonna show up the most, um, that I felt, hey, we're good, you know, that I never really worried about it. Um, Cause it's a lot of work to try to manage that. I mean, ultimately, I guess it really comes down to, does the GIS manage it? If the GIS didn't, then I wasn't gonna mess with it. Um, Cause it's, it's, it's a lot of work to even find it and try to deal with it. But, you know, if the GI, most of the time I'd say, I don't know if I've seen many GIS, if any, although they're out there that had the actuals, but um, it, you know, for me, I felt pretty comfortable, especially in anything I was stamping, I felt very comfortable using nominals. Perfect. Let's see. Uh, I thought this one was interesting from Fletcher. 
uh, is what in terms of data you're using to calibrate uh, the, the model is one hour SCADA data typically good enough for planning level calibration or is a finer time step desirable for like 15 minutes or a minute kind of frequency something like that I, I imagine you're probably getting you know data from all kinds of different sources right when it comes to calibration so it might be hard to specify a single time step but it is an hour basically good enough I think an hour is sufficient yeah, the only time I think it tinier might be if you're doing hydrant flow tests where you're caring about, hey, when did a fire pump come on and how did those pressures change? Uh, you know, we used to sometimes have a a person at the pump station or in the SCADA who was writing things down, you know, so that we could guarantee, all right, we got that information so we didn't have to go back and SCADA and get it. Uh, but yeah, EPS calibration hour was, was awesome, you know. Um, but yeah, that's probably the only other time where tinier amounts really matter. This is more of a comment and a question that came in here from Rich. I thought it was interesting though, in terms of calibration steps and maybe doing field verification, he says, don't be reluctant to ask questions about operations from both operators and distribution staff. Absolutely. I've found closed valves, water services running continuously into the basement of a vacant house, wrong yes. pipe sizes, et cetera, to kind of verify Everything absolutely. that's in your model, I think that's <laughs> absolutely comment there. Uh, kind of get data from everywhere uh, to, to calibrate your model as best you can. Hey, one other thing on on like a hydrant flow test that I think a lot of other people don't look at is is the pressure drop number. You know, before the test and after the test, I think that pressure drop number is really the money number. You know, because the field pressure drop versus the model pressure drop is really how close, you know, as is your model versus the field, you know, how, if those are very different, my pressure drop in my model is much greater than the field that's usually a connectivity issue. Pressure drop in the field is way greater than the model that's usually a pretty close or pretty strong indicator. There's a closed valve somewhere in the field that no one knows about. Um, but like that, that kind of comparison, I think was really, really helpful, you know, cause like, Hey, if if my model was five psi high, you know, before the fire, and five psi low uh, after the fire, a lot of people would say, "Hey, I'm within five psi. I'm good. Stop." But that's ten psi difference in pressure drop. That's kind of why I think it's helpful looking at that. But I don't know, Matt. Did you guys ever do that or or look at that? I to me that always made me feel so much more comfortable personally. But I don't know what you guys do. Uh, that's part of my standard practice to look at pressure drop. Yeah. A good kind of summary question since we had quite a bit of discussion on C factors. This question from Russell. Any advice on lowest C factor that you would ever think of putting in a model, basically, uh, that you would say is still within a reasonable engineering uh, judgment there? Um. I think the lowest C factor I ever put in the model for unlined cast iron pipe was 25. Um, and that was based on a sample um, that we saw a six inch pipe that actually only had one inch of opening from a sample pipe that the agency had. <laughs> mine, mine is generally, I start to get nervous, anything 45, 50. But yeah, I'd, I'd probably, if I knew it was like that, I'd start changing the diameter. Uh, you know, anything lower than that, it's it's usually, it's because, yeah, it, and, it's and, a smaller and, diameter. And, and I would say for non online cast iron pipe, probably 100 would be the lowest I'd be comfortable to go. Okay. Matt, I don't know if you have a thought on that. Yeah, I mean, anything unlined, I mean, I certainly, certainly 100, I, I would, yeah, 100 would be my absolute lowest for sure. I'd, I'd probably even 110, yeah. you know, uh, I'd be, I'd be wanting to check other things, uh, you know, uh, you know, before, um, but, uh, um, you know, pretty much in that table that we had in there, if it, you know, if it was, I don't think we ever varied more between five to at most 10 points from the averages on, on numbers there, except for cast iron, online cast iron. That was the only one that, you know, was on there, but everything else pretty much we stuck with what was there and 
almost all the time those were always reasonable and so we just said oh and if they weren't we, we found it was something else um you know whether it's a closed valve or a connectivity issue uh and that was it perfect and just a reminder for everybody out here asking questions we might not be able to get to all of these in the next 10 minutes but we'll uh be sure to email you kind of an answer to your question if we don't get it during this hour here um question came in here though uh from cassia in new mexico uh kind of throwing out a, a difficult system to calibrate in a system with 24 pressure zones and extreme elevation change uh what is the best way uh, that, that you might go about trying to strategically calibrate something like that there's a distinct you know trunk and reservoir flow through the system so i suspect trunk zones would be easier to calibrate uh than uh than pressure zones, I think. But given that, where, where would you, where would you start with with just a large, complicated kind of project like that? Maybe. Um. So, I often start by looking at extreme pressures and extreme velocities and head losses in the model. Mm -hmm. So, I, I want to say, you know, is there something that's so out of whack that it seems unreasonable. Mm -hmm. And then from there, um, it, you know, this is one of those places where I, those kind of complex models, I almost sometimes find ETS is easier to start from than steady state. Yeah. And the industry will disagree with me, but, um, and the reason why is, uh, the biggest thing I want to check for first is if I have flow going between pressure zones where there shouldn't be flow between zones. Right. You know, Most then. Good. Yeah. Some curves are good. Once once you have that, then you can kind of go back and, and look at things on a zone by zone basis. I think also knowing your end use for it, what are you worried about? You know, are you going to do flow design then you know maybe in in a zone where you're going to do that maybe i definitely want to do some hydrant tests uh if i'm using this for planning purposes then you know or i'm operationally then i definitely want to know how i want to feel very comfortable with eps calibration uh, you know that's again you know it's the purpose it tells you what do i really want to know comfortably with the calibration because steady state calibration eps calibration are going to tell you different things Perfect. Um, and again, another thing I've put that again, as these questions continue to come in, another thing I've put um, in the chat are one, a couple of links to some of those upcoming events. But at the bottom, the last link I put in there is to a LinkedIn group uh, that you can join and kind of continue this conversation. There are a lot of people uh, hmm. not necessarily asking questions in here, but have comments and suggestions for people and kind of thoughts that, uh, you know, you can go back and forth on uh, with not just Matt uh pat and myself but the whole kind of water distribution community there so if you wanted to uh join that linkedin you can start to continue that conversation and and post there as well um and they also these are also questions that we get a lot in support mm -hmm. i mean not that we can we can tell you you must do this but we can at least say hey here's some things to think about you know to consider um because sometimes that makes you feel at least a little more comfortable in going okay now now at least don't feel like I have no idea, you know, of of what I might consider, you know, and think about, you know, and all oh, we're always glad to help with that because yeah. that is, I I know what it's like being on the other side of the table, you know, being that young engineer, you know, and and being like, man, I wish I could just pick someone's brain, you know, and yeah. uh, I I I always appreciated those people who did that for me. Uh, and so here at support, you know, if your info care is up to date, you can contact us for help and stuff like that all the time. We get, mm -hmm. we get people who ask us about questions just like this for that very reason. So yeah, um, yeah, they, they can, the support the support number is right there, actually below Patrick's yep. name on the slide that's that's being shown there. So you can uh, call that anytime. Get an engineer here and help and answer that question. Speaking of kind of beginning uh, questions here, here's one from Peter. Uh, can you elaborate further on uh, uh, he's saying conductivity, but I think he means 
Maybe it means conductivity. Um, I, I guess I read it first. I thought it was connectivity. I'm an, an experienced model and it helped me a lot to understand what you mean by this. Did we mention conductivity earlier or does he mean connectivity, do we think? I'm guessing connectivity. Connectivity. Uh, connectivity. Would be my yeah. guess. That's what I kind of figured too, connectivity uh, issues there. So how would you uh, kind of further identify those? I know how we go about it from an Innovise side. We've got a lot of tools for addressing connectivity, but curious uh, Matt's thoughts on that. I would I would point you to the tools that the Innovise has as part of their InfoWater or InfoWater Pro platform that, that looks for connectivity issues in the GIS. Yeah, I'd say nodes in close proximity, pipes of candidates, and I would also add to that um, diameter discrepancies greater than 12 inches should definitely be examined. <laughs> Only, especially the large to small, not so much concerned about small to large, uh, but you know, like a 36, 36, 6, 36, that, that's going to cause some head loss. That's going to be a concern. But almost guaranteed, nodes in close proximity, pipes for cans will almost guaranteed to cause a major issue in calibration, and so should always be uh, investigated. Those are the primary ones that are pretty much 99% guaranteed to be a problem and should guaranteed be fixed. Yeah. A couple of questions in here about the recording of this. Uh, Traditionally, we would like for people to join live and get their questions answered, but especially with this one, I think we will uh, have it live or, or the recording on our website later and probably sent out as well to all registrants. So just wanted to add that for some of those questions there. Three minutes left. Um, one question here from James. Any comments and thoughts about merging two calibrated models together that don't have the same steady state timestamp used? Uh, I'm not so sure this what is a whole interesting issue. It's, yeah, it's like I was like a I, different pattern time stuff, and that's that's going to be tricky. Mm -hmm. Doable, yeah, but it's patterns tricky. are different. Yeah. It's going to need some massaging. Um, I, I, I'm not sure what was meant by steady state time step, but you know there 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 are a lot of challenges that you'll have with that. And, yeah. and, That's and, and due to the amount of time, I would say. Oh. Contact Patrick at, yeah. at the support desk. <laughs> yeah, because that's that that's probably gonna. I mean, it's, I'm sure there's a way to do it. It's just it's gonna take a little bit of effort probably to to fix it, but it's doing it's dual. Yeah. Okay. Uh, hopefully, there's like maybe maybe there's a quick one here from Andrew. Uh, how many fire flow tests do you recommend per zone or per miles uh, of mm. pipe? Good question. What you feel comfortable with? What do you say, Matt, on that one? I know it's hard because it's it's expensive and it takes a lot of time. Every test you do it means you got to add it to your budget for calibrating too. Um, I'm throwing a number from the hip here. Yeah. But I would say maybe one per population of five thousand people. Yeah, our roughly rule of thumb, and it again, it really depends. Was you know one or two a zone at least, but big zones definitely one or two is not enough. You know, you just kind of gotta look at it. I mean, ultimately, you just you know you want to get reasonable coverage of the system. That that's really kind of that guidance. You know, I mean, if just a tiny zone, one per zone is pretty good. Ultimately, you kind of want to get the edges, you know, you, you want to because that's that's going to push it and any connectivity issues in between are going to really become obvious. That's kind of to me why those edges are kind of more useful because I'm looking for those connectivity issues. And if I if 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 I don't have any problems there, I'm probably OK in between, you know, and that that's kind of why I'm, you know, when I was setting those out, kind of why I liked you're looking at a map and seeing a nice distribution of where the tests were throughout the system, but definitely trying to get some on the edges. That that usually made me feel comfortable that being all right, we're, we're generally going to be pretty good. 
All right, perfect. Looks like we're out of time here as we just hit 11 o'clock. But again, thank you all for joining. Thank you, Matt and Pat yeah, for thanks coming for on here. Good stuff. Uh, for, for anyone, again, that's looking for the recording, we'll, we'll probably have that sent out to all registrants here. And then if you're looking for yeah, then the slides used today or that um, PDF of <clears throat> C factors, those are both in the handouts of GoToWebinar here. So we'll hang out for maybe a couple minutes if folks haven't downloaded those yet. Uh, but again, thank you all and uh, look forward to seeing you in two weeks uh, for our next Water Talks. Yeah, thanks, man. It's great. Appreciate your time and putting this together.